All right. Uh, a lot of y'all know me as Johnny X. My real name is also Drew, and I've been doing um, this panel for 21 years. The panel is officially old enough to break down. Woo! We will not be serving alcohol before we get to this panel. So sorry about that, folks. Um, we're gonna try to keep this relatively concise. We only have an hour, and there are people in the room after us. But if you come to Hacking 201 tomorrow night, the FF track room, we can go all night long. We'll have uh, demos, we'll have pizza, we'll have other entertainment and refreshments available for you. This is the somewhat serious one. Uh, who has not been to Hacking 101 before? Raise your hand. All right, this is kind of like an introduction to what hacking is and what hacking isn't. And we'll have um, references, URLs, ways you can learn more about it, get into the wonderful, wacky world of hacking. And we mean that the good guy, white hat sense, not the bad guy, evil criminal sense, because we don't like those folks. I will give you a basic, basic um, uh, reference point here. Think of old cowboy movies. You can always tell, especially the black and white, who the good guys were versus the bad guys. The good guys wore the white hats, the bad guys wore the black hats. We want to steer people who are interested in getting into computers, IT, hacking, and original non criminal system to work, work towards the white hat world and away from the uh, black hat world. So I'm going to shut up and let the panelists introduce themselves, including our random replacement. They've got to give you their names and tell you a little bit about themselves, what they do, and how they got into the wonderful wacky world of hacking. I'll ask them a couple of questions, give you some basic information you think of questions you want to ask, and we'll do about the last 30 minutes of the panel. Entirely audience question and answer driven. So, take it away, let's start down at the very end of the table, please. Thank you. My name is Jay Freeman, but everyone online knows me as Sora. I run Cedia, the alternative to the App Store for Jailbroken iPhones. I was a member of the iPhone dev team, current member of Exploiteers, uh, from the adjunct of Fail Overflow. Uh, now I'm the CTO of one of those silly blockchain products that are way too much of them. I'm, uh, I'm Matt Blaze. I, um, lately, I've been a professor in the computer science department at the U of Penn. Uh, before that, I was at Bell Labs, and I've been a hacker since before I knew that that's what it was called. Hey everyone, I'm Erica Portnoy. I'm a technologist at EFF, of the Electronic Frontiers Foundation. We are a uh, advocacy group fighting for rights in the digital world. Uh, at EFF, I work with our lawyers and activists to achieve policy goals, such as working on stopping crypto backdoors and uh, protecting net neutrality. I also am a coder at EFF. I work on Surfbot, which is a tool that helps people turn on HTTPS for their websites using websites. Uh, my name is Xavier Esch. Um, I've been hacking since the late 80s. I've uh, been in the security industry since the early 90s. Um, I've been a lot of, uh, spent a lot of my time as a consultant and a lot of different uh, things in the InfoSec community. Uh, right now, I run an uh, incident response team for a local uh, financial institution. Um, so, yeah. My name is Ray Kelly, and I'm a practice principal at a company called Microfocus, who was formerly HP Enterprise, who was formerly HP. And uh, I helped write one of the first web application scanners called WebInspect back in 2002. And uh, that's what I do now. All right, that's us. That's you. I you. So, panelists, tell us how. Let's start at the end. We're going down again. How did you get into hacking, and uh, how did you define hacking? The first kind of thing. Two part question. Um, I originally got into hacking. I think it's actually an interesting question. I've seen before. I got into hacking. I was working on low level systems. Uh, essentially through um, a lot of programming and trying to figure out how things work. And so a lot of times when you're a kid, that's the only way you can figure out how to do things, is taking them apart. At least three years old as I am. Mean, the audience nowadays, you can use YouTube, you can go and do uh, a lot of tutorials at the time. I mean, I essentially had software that I could take apart that was written by other people in order to figure out how it worked. Um, a lot of hacking to me is about trying to figure out how to make software do things it wasn't really intended to do. Um, trying to uh, work around the uh, limits on behavior that people have put into place on, on systems that are both formal and informal. Um, hacking is something that can sometimes be uh, very uh, like a social endeavor when you're when you're um, working around this uh, process for a lot of people. And sometimes it's fun to that um, working around hardware software. So I guess I got into hacking. I'm old, um, and uh, you know I, I I kind of predate. Um, when it was easy to have a personal computer. So I went through a route that's pretty common for people. 
their old um, uh, uh, to have gotten into hacking, which was through exploring the telecommunication system that was available to me when I was you know, a single digit number age. And that was the phone system, uh, the old Bell telephone system. And there was uh, a community of people interested in electronics who would kind of try to figure out well, how do you make your phone do things that it's not supposed to do? How can you, you know, set up conference calls even though that wasn't the thing that they were able to do? How can you maybe make free phone calls when you, you aren't the phone company doesn't really want you to be able to do that? And that group kind of called itself the Phone Freaks, um, and they spelled it uh, with a PH for freaks in order to you know, honor the fact that it's the telephone. But almost everybody in that community it, you know, ended up evolving once the computer came out to becoming interested in how to do the same kinds of things tinkering with uh, the computer. And uh, that is exactly the path that I follow uh, into this. And how would I define hacking? I would define hacking as um, trying to understand how something works on your own terms and make it work um, for you rather than um, what uh, was in, what it's intended to do, how to make something um, work past its own presumed limits. And I would define that really broadly and it doesn't necessarily even involve things to do with electricity. Mystery's been more embarrassing. Uh, so I guess you could kindly call it I, uh, privacy advocacy is the angle I came from, but uh, this started when I was much younger, and as we all know, kids are evil on the inside. So uh, back in middle school, I recently rediscovered this, I had completely forgotten this, I found one of my notebooks from middle school where I had written all of my friends' locker combinations. Because <laughs> I had shoulder surfed their locker combinations so that I'd be able to enter any of their lockers whenever I wanted. Uh, which is a bit of an offline story, it doesn't have a computer in it, but it's the same sort of ethos as, you know, things that happen on a computer with passwords and authentication that we worry about today, and that keep our bank accounts and everything safe. Um, and it was some number of years before I turned that into advocacy. In the middle, I got challenged to, someone said I couldn't find her birthday. Yeah, okay, you can find anyone's birthday on the internet. This was well before Facebook. Um, and then people, I would, so I would tell the story, people would say, oh, but I bet you can't find my birthday. I spent years proving everybody wrong because I wanted to show them how cool I was. But over time, this turned into a desire to help people realize, no, really, you need to be more careful about your privacy on this thing called the internet. Because there are people out there who have all your information. And it's not great that they have all your information, and it gets more and more every year. And that eventually turned into trying to keep that amount of information as controlled by the person so, um, I think my first <coughs> hack was convincing the neighborhood kids that the uh, flight simulator program that I was running on my uh, IBM uh, uh, XT was, was real. I was like flying a real airplane. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, it, it was really freaked out by the neighborhood kids. But uh, I, seriously, I got into, uh, again, I'm a little bit old. Uh, not, not nearly as old as, 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 as you know, others, but uh, you know, BBS. Uh, so I, I, I ran a BBS, um, and then I got involved with some of the stuff that you could read about in Kevin Mitnick's novels, uh, uh, you know, based on a true story. Um, and uh, and so basically, once the uh, BBS has started connecting up uh, uh, across the nation, I started learning all sorts of information and got involved with the local 2600 group. Which I was love to, just love to hear that they're still meeting at the same place in the uh, uh, food court of the Linux Mall once a month. I did this in the, you know in the 90s to, to learn all sorts of great things about hacking, and you can still get started with 2600 by going to you know, Linux Mall and meeting a bunch of hackers. So uh, that's how I got started. Uh, I also came through a kind of a different path. Uh, so I had already been developing for many years. And in the early 2000s, a buddy of mine goes, hey, Ray, we're going to start this startup, and we're going to go and attack web applications. Now, we can't pay you, but we think it'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, I'm in. So uh, I kind of got through and uh, started uh, attacking web applications and just fell in love with it. And kind of along those lines, how do I find, define hacking? I define it as breaking shit. And that's where you find a website, you're going to do everything you can do to break it and make it act unexpectedly to get what you want out of it. So that's how I find that. 
So you mentioned 2,600 and 2,600 meetings. Uh, how many people are local to the Atlanta area? So Lenox Mall Food Court, first Friday of each month, 6 o'clock is it? 6 o'clock? Yeah. And um, walk over to the people who are sitting at the tables who have a whole bunch of laptops, friendly folks, open, anyone can show up, any experience level. If you know nothing, everyone starts from somewhere. They will teach you and hopefully guide you in the right direction. Any age, uh, young, old, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, 2600's website is real easy, 2600.com. They have a convention up in New York City every two years called Hope, Hackers on Planet Earth. And they have a magazine that comes out quarterly, which is carried at Barnes & Noble, for those of you who can still read stuff printed on dead tree material. And it's also called 2600. Um, the 2600 magazine actually grew out of, this is go, goes back and I can give you a little bit of history, a few more resources you can investigate if you listen to the audio recording later on. Um, the very first hacking phone freak magazine came out in the 1970s and Abby Hoffman was involved with it and part of the reason they were interested in getting free phone calls is the Vietnam War was still going on at the time and Ma Bell, and you had kind of a government sanctioned monopoly for those of you who are not old enough to remember it, Ma Bell pretty much was the phone company who had no other options. They put a 15% tax on long distance calls to go directly to support the Vietnam War effort. And of course, a lot of people who were opposed to it said, well, we're not going to pay for that. So they started sharing um, tips and technology through Xeria, uh, uh, mimeographed um, news uh, letter zine that was mailed out on how to rip the phone company so you wouldn't have to send your money to support the Vietnam uh, War effort. It was originally called. Yipple Youth International Party Line. It was then changed to TAP after about, uh, about a dozen issues. The Technology Assistance Program, it ran from 1970 to 1982. You can find the PDFs online if you do a Google search for Yipple, um, Y I P L, and TAP, T A P. And that morphed into 2600 Magazine when uh, TAP's offices mysteriously burned down. They claimed the FBI did it back in 1982. And a lot of the same people who were involved with um, TAP then started putting out 2600 Magazine, which continues to this day. And if you want to learn about the even earlier decades of uh, hacking that started back in the 50s, look for a book called Hacking, or Red Hackers, pardon me, by Stephen Levy, L E D Y. So that's my info dump. I'm done with that. Next question for the panelists um, Tell us about the hack you learned the most from that you totally screwed up? Your best epic fail that you learned the most from? And if you need a second, um, while you're thinking, we're going to, when we switch over to audience question and answer, we'll pass a hat too to get more of your money so we can start collecting on the pizza fund we're at 201. And if anyone's interested, um, I was even persuaded to bring the cattle product in this year. So, fresh batteries, dollar a hit. Um, if cattle product is too scary, cling on sex toy, dollar a hit. <laughs> right. Ready? So, here's a product. Actually, I released it. To some extent, it works because it does something useful for somebody, but it does not do at all what I wanted to do. Sedia uh, Impactor. So, the idea of Sedia Impactor was supposed to be that um, what if on an iPhone, you could install any app from the App Store and make whatever modifications you wanted to make to it as if you were to have a jailbroken iPhone within that scope of that one application. And there were all sorts of tricks that had to go into this. Um, and one of the big things was um, uh, just being able to do an installation of an app from the phone. And after a very large amount of time staring at the problem and working with a bunch of people on it, we, we came up with a technique um, whereby you could set up a VPN, and then tell the open up the web browser, and have the web browser go to the, a URL, which is a, what is known as a manifest file, which describes uh, where to download an application from, and then have that application download um, the information, not from a website, but from the phone itself. And the VPN is essentially just reflecting all the packets internally. And I built the whole thing, and it took months to do all the work to get all of the developments and every, all the tools, editing, uh, working on the phone, and the VPN works seamlessly so the user could actually understand the process to get the whole thing set up. And uh, we tested it, it was great, and then I released it, and, and like five minutes after releasing it to the world and announcing how awesome it was, you should download it, somebody posts this screenshot of a giant error message. And I'm like, 
what is this error message? So this error message is saying uh, essentially that uh, you, you, like the user needs to have a paid development account. Well, let the developer. I know you don't need a paid developer account. Apple's got these free developer accounts. And then I realized it had been months since I had tested with a free developer account. And then in fact, wait, maybe this. Oh no. And then I go and I check, and it turns out in order to use a VPN, you have to have a paid developer account. And then somehow months had gone by where I and the other people I've been working with on this project had not noticed the fact that we were building something that would only work for people who didn't need it in the first place. <laughs> and I got all the way to the point of final release release to the public before finding out that it failed. Uh, thankfully, uh, the community found something else to do with it, and I never really told anyone what I wanted to do with it. And so everyone was like, this is a big success from sort. Uh, but from my perspective, it was just this like, devastating failure. Um, but uh, one of the big things I learned from this is, is you have to continuously test in the environment that you would like to be doing the actual final operation on. <laughs> you have to skim by testing. Okay, so I think I, I'm going to um, save myself a little bit because I said the one you learned the most from, and, and, and not tell you about the ones that um, I, I didn't learn anything from. <laughs> As long as they're funny. Yeah. So I, I think the one that I, I learned the most from, and that was ended up, you know, na snatching success out of the mouth of failure. Uh, so uh, I was looking at this protocol, uh, communications protocol, actually not on the internet, but used over two-way radio, a protocol called T25, and it's used by the federal government to um, uh, encode uh, radio. Uh, like two-way radio that are used by things like the, the FBI and the Secret Service and, and those kinds of things. And, and I started out by looking at the, the protocol spec because I wanted to see if there were security flaws in this protocol. And I thought, you know, there's this really, really subtle flaw in, you know, if you kind of look at, at this packet, you can kind of resend another packet. I wonder if uh, this can work in practice. And so what I did was I, I set up a system, uh, after talking to a lot of lawyers, um, it, to intercept all of the federal government radio traffic over the air that I can get. And I actually set up a, a, a receiver which would find this P25 radio traffic and I'd record basically all of the, the bits that we're getting. And I was specifically only interested in the encrypted traffic. And so I set up this, you know, went to a lot of work to set up this, this sort of listening post environment to um, filter out, ignore all of the clear traffic, and just record the bits of the encrypted traffic. And it just didn't work at all. It never record anything. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out what on earth is wrong with it. And so finally, I, I get a T25 radio and I just program it, it doesn't have any encryption in it, to one of the, the frequencies, just to kind of test it uh, on my own. And the first thing I start hearing on this radio <coughs> is um, the, um, uh, this surveillance operation on the street that I'm on, with these FBI agents who are following <laughs> someone around. Uh, and it wasn't me they were following. <laughs> but you know, it was, like, it was pretty nearby, and I'm thinking, well, what's going on? Why am I not? Why am I not getting this, and why am I hearing it? And it turned out that the protocol failure that I had discovered was, you know, kind of interesting, but it was completely dwarfed by a failure that their encryption just didn't work at all. And everything was going out uh, in, in the clear. And it took about two months before I actually noticed this, because I was just so focused on finding their encrypted traffic that I didn't follow the first rule of, uh, of, of cryptanalysis, which is look for clear text. <laughs> I also had a look for clear text story, but I'm not going to tell you two in a row because I guess this is the theme here. Instead, you all get math time. Sorry, everyone. Okay, so there's this thing called oblivious RAM, which sounds like it should be a hardware thing, but is in fact a privacy -pre preserving data structure that lets you do queries over somebody else's database without leaking anything to that database. The problem with ORAM is this description that I just said all full of these jargon words. Yeah, the papers describing how to implement it are all 10 times worse than that. So I was working on a project and I was like, oh, this sounds so complicated. I don't want to have to deal with it. 
uh, the person I was working with was like, hey, it sounds like an ORM storage project, you could use that. I'm like, ah, oh, whatever, I just want to do that. So I sit there and I'm like, okay, I'll just do like a more lightweight version of this. I will have my data structure and I'll query it and maybe I'll just like try to blind the query a little bit, you know, I'll put two queries at a time so you won't know like which of the two it was. Okay, I go, I implement that, I come back, I go to write up what I did and I realize, oh no, the math doesn't work out. Obviously you could tell which one it was because if you just look at the probability, the Bayesian probability of having chosen this one given that it was chosen, whatever, you don't need to worry about all this anyway, that one didn't work. So I go, I do a more complicated version of it, I was like, okay, this time I'll grab like a whole stack of entries from this uh, database, I'll grab like 10 of them at a time, just pick some number K, it'll probably be fine, do the same thing, spend another month implementing the entire thing, I write it up, only to get to the end and realize it has the exact same mathematical flaws as the previous version. I will spare you the future iterations of this. Needless to say, at the very end of this whole thing, I come to realize, oh, the entire point of ORAM is to create a mathematically secure and provable way of doing this operation that I tried in the first place. Uh, which is all to say two things that I learned from this. One is if you're trying to build a pr privacy-preserving database, you should use an ORAM data structure very applicable to your, data, to your daily life. And two, more important, is if someone who knows what they're talking about <coughs> mentions something early on, just do that thing. <laughs> so I think back at the thing that I learned most from, I actually was, it was um, year 2000, we just won this nice big contract at Yahoo and moved a whole bunch of their servers into our environment. And um, you know, back then, you couldn't really call yourself a screening person. It's just something you did as part of IT. But uh, there was uh, this thing that they later described as a denial of service attack, which it was, uh, if you look back, uh, Mafia Boy, one of the first uh, you know, serious uh, uh, distributed denial of service attacks. And, and uh, you know, it was, I just moved to third shift, and that was just lovely to be able to sit there and say, yes, Yahoo is down. <laughs> I was the manager, I had to sit there and explain, yes, I, I know that Yahoo is down, we are trying to figure out how to do this, there's just lots of data coming in. We, you know, I thought you put all these servers, yes, we have lots of servers, and it was, was you know, pre-cloud stuff, you know, so it didn't have all the scaling. But yeah, so I, I, I did, you know, we eventually figured out how to move around the servers uh, uh, to, 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 we ended up being down for about an hour. Um, and then one of the you know, uh, most interesting man hunts that I got to participate with the FBI on. And, and there was a lot of the data that I collected in, in being able to figure out how to uh, uh, get that data over the FBI. Uh, I think that they uh, And the Royal Mountie Police. Those, if you ever have the choice between working with the FBI or the Canadians, did, the Canadians are just so much more fun, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that, that, that's the, I definitely learned a whole lot from that. And, and, and being able to withstand a denial of service attack, and I still use a lot of those uh, uh, lessons learned today. So. Well, I didn't learn anything from this, but I made someone really angry, some stranger probably. So, uh, <laughs> working on uh, Web Inspect, I was working on a Java parser, and this is way back. And, uh, this were, our app was written in VB, VB6. <laughs> That's how old we're talking. So, uh, we had, you know, JavaScript was all the rage then, you know, it was just now coming on site. I was like, hey, we need to figure out how to crawl the website. We need to be able to click on links that are JavaScript, you know, fired up on JavaScript. And so I go ahead and code it up one night, figure out, okay, I think this is working good. So we click on a, it finds some JavaScript and execute it. And just make, so I know it would work, it would pop up a window. And it's supposed to close the window back when it finished executing uh, on my computer, just so I could see that it was actually doing something. And so I had it all coded up, and back then we really didn't have a QA department as a startup, so our, uh, our QA department was the internet. <laughs> so we were just basically scanning the internet for issues. By the way, that's a terrible sales tactic when you call a customer and say, hey, Dan, you're, you're a one with SQL injection. Who are you? <laughs> are you doing that? We, we quit doing that. So uh, <laughs> I, uh, I let this thing go late at night on some clothing company. It, just some random clothing company, didn't think anything of it, should be fairly innocuous, innocuous. And I go out to dinner at like Waffle House at 1 a.m. I come back and my computer's completely locked up. And if you remember on Windows XP, when you open up a lot of uh, 
like windows, that if you open them enough, they just become smaller and smaller and smaller. All I saw were slivers down at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> Nothing was responsive. I'm like, what in the heck went wrong here? And I start looking at the pop-ups that they weren't going away, and I'm looking, and I start seeing messages going, hello, are you there? Hello, can I help you? Apparently it was one of the, and then, please stop. Stop doing this. And apparently I found the online uh, chat line with somebody on the other end. We were doing SQL injection, you know, tick or one equals one, script, alert, hello. 50,000 attacks over the course of probably like one hour, and some poor soul is on the other end. <laughs> what do you mean one equals one? Of course one equals one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. All right. Um, audience mic is over there. Start lining up if you've got questions for the panelists. It's, if it's for the entire uh, panel, just say this is for the entire panel. If it's for a particular panelist, say, hey, I have a question for such and such and ask your question. So don't everybody run over there at once. Um, and it, while we're doing that, do that, do that. yeah. We're going to have uh, my lovely and talented assistants, uh, Dustin and Stacy, start going around and collecting uh, pizza money for Hacking 201. Uh, we start Hacking 201. Oh, there we go. Uh, we start doing Hacking 201 at 10 p.m. tomorrow night in the FF track room. We go till whenever, but we usually break at midnight and order a whole bunch of pizzas. And just so you won't feel weird about randomly throwing money into some stranger's box or bag there to keep everything honest, at the end of this panel, we'll go out into the hallway, we'll count it publicly, you can film it, we'll make sure as many people as possible have the totals, we'll have receipts for the pizzas. So we've been doing this for 21 years, we haven't had an issue yet. So we all stop, start heading around. Uh, you go ahead and ask your question, and I'll be over here for anyone who wants to uh, take a hit from the Klingon sex toy, dollar a hit, and we'll try to amuse you in a variety of different ways. Okay, and so. if you don't want to donate, just enable Bluetooth on your phone, and we'll get to you next week. It's not a question, it's just really one. Uh, a while back, uh, I've been coming to so I don't know how to work a few years back, and I always have to ask, where do I start? Where do I start? And one of the last times I asked, Johnny actually told me, just here. I'll just collect and bring it to you, since we only have one bucket. Thank you.
get cheap, powerful hardware, there's uh, open source software, you can build your own uh, test penetration certification lab for next to nothing. And it, it's really fun when you've got a bunch of people who do this together because you can try to attack and defend each other's systems. There's no reason to go out and find a system online to try to play with. That will, the laws are very strict these days, that will get you in trouble. You can build this stuff yourself and learn a whole lot and have a lot of fun too. So that's one of my suggestions for you. Um, do a Google search for Network King of the Hill. You'll find the GitHub repositories. It's maintained by uh, Keith Watson, who's uh, one of the head information guys at Georgia Tech. So there's a lot of local support and development for this. Thank you so much. So I'm curious as to when you guys are working with someone to find some stuff in terms of, uh, I guess, security, uh, what's one of the most interesting things that you found, whether it in whether it's uh, something you didn't want to see or something that's just like really shocking, like, wow, what, a, what is this? This is new. There's something new. Something even different from new. I, I did come across, this was late, late 90s, or 2000s, but it was a, um, the first time I had come across a printer that was serving as a where's server. You know, because uh, it had big hard drives and to store all of the you know, images that this printer had printed, copier, you know, as well as print, printer copier things, and it had, you know, a whole gigabyte worth of space, which, you know, somebody had found a way to drop a FTP site on and we share all sorts of illegal software uh, off of this web site. Uh, and so, yeah, that was pretty nice. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Are you just looking for something? You're looking for something new, or are you looking for something funny? Or are you looking for something you know, funny, something you didn't expect to see, or something that when you saw it, you thought, I could, you know, um, this is something new, or so, so something so, you haven't seen before that you could tell other people to, you know, you figure out how to do something, and then you tell other people how to do it. Okay. I'm, I can answer when it's funny. At least. All right, yeah, funny. So, um, <laughs> uh, the HBO Go application a while ago, uh, it turns out that it, it had an SSL certificate for local hosts. Uh, what, what it was doing, like they got into our assignment to provide an SSL certificate to secure connections to local folks. And I, I don't think anyone's allowed to do this anymore. We're showing the certificate transparency laws that we look at. But the, uh, and the reason they were doing that was essentially a man and build themselves in some extent so that they'd be able to um, do all of their weird DRM tricks uh, with their own custom protocol to their server, but then use the Apple standard um, uh, streaming HTTP interface to show all the video local. Which was which was Apple required SSL and then defeated by getting to the, the local host. Uh, and we discovered this because um, their certificate was getting flagged and was crashing the fix that we had for a serious iPhone bug that we had. And when I started trying to, then I was like, I want that certificate. And so I started pulling it apart and I figured out that they had hidden it by taking, they they encrypted the, the certificate using the using a password that they basically form coded and then fragmented into three parts. And when I finally put it all back together, they seriously put, put in Amsterdam's code with a zero instead of an O. And, and it's just like really large organizations do do this thing where it's like, okay, I'm gonna secure something by taking some silly little password and like the zeros instead of the O's sort of thing. And I'm going to like, for like a major application that's distributed to tens of millions of people, but actually, that's, 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 they actually do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll, 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 without being specific, uh, okay. And the, the thing that just strikes me every single time, uh, you know, I relearn the same lesson, which is I find myself saying, well, I'm not going to bother trying this because it can't possibly be that simple. And, and I'm always wrong. It's like every single time, um, you know, it, it, it's, you no, know, that thing that you think won't, can't possibly work is exactly what works. Yeah, that's a, I had a situation like that. So when our, uh, a startup got acquired by a large company, over 100,000 employees. Uh, we came in there and we felt, of course, obliged to help do an on-site pen test for them. Not necessarily with them knowing, but uh, I was a manager at the time, and so I had employees that worked for me. And immediately the thing that I saw was that all of our employee IDs were sequential. So all of our whole group, you know, was eight digits, and they all seemed fairly sequential. And through their HR portal, where you give people raises, I can see stock options, salaries for everybody. Okay, so, uh, so I thought, okay, well let me try this. You know, surely they check that everybody is a manager who they're supposed to be. 
know, I showed only certain people that were ordered to me. And so I intercepted the traffic, sure enough, and started enumerating IDs. And then, boom, here comes Scott. He doesn't work for me. And I can see his salary, his, uh, you know, stock options, how long he's been there, everything about that employee. <laughs> so, uh, but that wasn't the interesting part. So that was kind of neat. But I was like, you know what? I need to know what the big guys make. I don't know what the CEO makes, the vice president. And I don't have enough time to bust through 100,000. Okay, they just disappear. So uh, they had a, a portal. Uh, website where they keep, it's almost like a SharePoint, right? People can just upload documents or do whatever. And out of curiosity, I thought, I'm going to type in my employee ID and just hit search and see what comes back. An Excel spreadsheet comes back with every single employee's identification number, their ID number, 100,000 employees, and then now I had the entire Keys of the Kingdom uh, via a SharePoint and just stupid logic in their code. I had something similar. It was uh, started in you know, a new company. And they had their bios locked, right? So you couldn't even go. And, and they had like uh, virtualization turned off in the bios, so you couldn't like actually install VMware and stuff like that. So I just went to the search dot whatever dot com, you know, and they had like some uh, 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 SharePoint portal search thing, search for bios password. It was there, oh, <laughs> but it was secured. I, and it said you do not have permission to have, to, to access this page. Why do you need access to it? You know, like I had a little, little window there. It's like, why do you need access? It's like, um, because, period, and five minutes later, somebody hit approve, and I had access to it. <laughs> we will hear more of these and hacking 201 if we go into greater detail. And since we're, are we going to be recording 201? Yes or no? Are we going to stop recording after? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and when we stop recording after uh, during 201, then we can start naming names. But we do have people waiting in line, so let's go ahead and move on to the next vote. We've got about, I think, 23 minutes left. Or okay, I did have a lot of questions, but I'm going to save one for 201. Yeah. Uh, I do appreciate y'all coming out and showing people that hacking is not just like one dimensional, like you said, the white and the black caps. And, the things like Kevin Mitnick did. And I are, just that. to jump in real quick, there are other hats, but we'll get into the details. Yeah, so, and I'm gray hats, ass I like hats. to keep it simple. Yeah. <laughs> I have a short truth hat. But a lot of people don't understand what hacking is, and then the multiple, you don't have to just be on the computer like what Frank Abagnale did as far as manipulating the check system. Even that, I consider, you know, it's a negative thing he did for, you know, personal gain, but. I love panels like this where people actually come out and interact with people and show them that there's two sides of it. There's a good and a bad. And then we'll have demos during 201 as well. It's like you said, hacking doesn't necessarily have to be a computer. The phone system was this amazingly complicated system that was undocumented and affected most people's lives where they didn't know how it worked back in those uh, 70s and early 80s before my bell broke up. So that was a legitimate target of hacking to figure out how it worked. Hacking it is exploring any complex system, this is my definition, and figuring out how to do things with it that even the designers didn't uh, know what to do with it. And Tell them how Captain uh, French got his name. The other thing is like what Sara did with Cydia, he took the closed system that you know, kind of made everything restrictive and not really good for the user and made it accessible and free form. I appreciate things like that. So thank you. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. See you at 201. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm actually, uh, I can freshen myself, but I'm actually continuing my education and everything. And it's actually opening up my mind to the different, well, I guess you can say special needs within the IT professional world and everything. And of course, one of them is computer We are security. a special needs community. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I was wondering, um, understanding the minds of a hacker and everything, how mind is, how important is that to someone who may be pursuing a uh, profession in computer security? I've got some comments on that, but I'll let the panelists go. You know, if, 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 if you are the type of person that, that found yourself taking everything apart, you know, there, there's, there's definitely the people that have that hacker mindset that everybody talks about. But there's a lot of things that you can do in information security that even if you aren't the person that took everything apart and you needed to know how everything worked, you can still find a place in the information security world. There are a lot of things we can do. I'm, I'm, I'm at a new company that's building you know, teams that do lots of different skills. 
you know, talk about application hacking, there's, you know, databases, networking, you know, people, intelligence, like all sorts of things. And so just the, the drive to be able to want to be in this community, you know, find your niche, find the thing that really, like, drives you, and, and go for that, because all of that is needed in the information security, security world. And so, you know, you don't have to be, have that mindset of a hacker that, that, that really, you know, wants to break everything. Uh, to be part of this group. So I've tended to work on the defense side of things. So my answer is a bit different from the, the hacker mindset uh, because you want to build these systems that people can't break into in the first place. And what that ends up involving is a lot of checklists. It involves a lot of careful work. It involves talking to the different teams to make sure you're all on the same page. One of you is not using one encoding while another is using another. Like all the things that create the bugs if you can stop them in the first place, the things that let you do that aren't necessarily technical magic and knowing everything in the OWASP page, although those are also helpful. You can learn those, but I think the core skills are more communication, sitting down at the meeting and deciding the way that you want to implement it. Like, we would, like, okay, we've had this thing that we, there's, there's always like one feature that you want. It would be great to put in ECDSA keys, right? But we just need to decide if we want to organize the file structure so like A comes before B or B comes before A. And like, you know, it's a bit of a bike shedding problem where you can't decide whether to paint the bike shed blue or red so you never paint it. Uh, and being able to overcome those sort of problems are what let you build the secure software in the first place. So if you're interested in making the world more secure by building a more secure world, teamwork and communication and being willing to work with other people are what I found are the things that make the most successful security teams. Exactly. Sometimes I don't see a parameter experience. That's just that's a DLC parameter experience. So I want to like amplify what Erica said and also sort of disagree a little bit on a couple things. I mean, first of all, the, the idea that one of the things that characterizes the most successful hackers is they have this very broad range of skills. In addition to sort of narrow obsession over some things, they also know how to, you know, they also know how to read and write, they know how to communicate with people, um, they know how to bring in a wide range of different skills and pieces of information to do things in unexpected ways. Um, and so, you know, the, sort of having a sort of broad range of knowledge and skills and exposure to different things is utterly, utterly, you know, um, critical, I think, to, to any aspect of being a hacker. But I, I want to sort of contradict that slightly by an observation that I've made as an educator, as someone in higher education, and as a high school dropout myself, um, of how badly formal education often serves uh, people who are often quite talented as actors. Um, you know, it's really, really common to see people who dropped out of school, um, um, you know, sometimes at a very young age, who, you know, sort of discovered computers and discovered this thing that they can be good at and gotten a career out of that. But ultimately, you know, the educational system has failed them in different ways. And uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, I try really hard to do, and some people in the computer science world try to do, is bridge that gap between the kind of formal uh, computer science education and the more freewheeling session driven uh, hacking. And, and we're starting to make some progress. Okay. Uh, we'll continue this for 201. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left, so let's try to keep uh, the responses to I'm not a professor. But you're a con, so we'll get our time to Next question. Thank you very much, guys. How we help? Hello. Earlier, Matt made a reference to speaking to many lawyers before moving in to try and check the encrypted FBI radio waves. I was wondering if any of you have had legal run-ins like that, where you wish hackers had, or lawyers had been available. And to follow that up, is there any kind of legal resource that you would recommend? <laughs> <laughs> would you like to take this one? Uh, well, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. <laughs> uh, so 
we are largely a law firm. Like we work, we do activism work, we do tech work. Um, I work on those, so those are the ones I mentioned. But one of the things we do is we defend hackers, um, and even if we aren't going to personally defend you, we have a whole network of people that we can contact. Um, info at EFF.org. If you uh, email that link, you can eventually be connected to the right people. I, I've certainly gotten cease and desist before from companies. Sometimes that I wasn't even doing anything against uh, Snapchat. Sent me a cease and desist. Like they, somebody else in the jailbreak community mentioned that they were going to do something, and of course I get the cease and desist. Um, I, I uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation in 2009 filed for a DMCA exemption for jailbreaking, and Apple slapped back with a 30-page document saying that no, this should mean like continue to be federally illegal. And that day, I went to my lawyer's office. My lawyer was not there. I just sat there until some lawyer at the firm was willing to spend half hour <laughs> looking at that document. Um, but yeah, sometimes legal issues come up, and sometimes they can be at least momentarily scary. And uh, I, I recommend that uh, you at least know a lawyer. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> She's asking for a friend, right? Sure. Yeah. EFF will be here all weekend. Just yes, sir. Hi. Uh, for those of us who are still looking to break into the IT industry, um, where do you all believe the job opportunities are currently at, and how should we train ourselves to go after those job opportunities? Uh, IT or security? Either. Uh, I know IT is a really broad thing yeah. right now, and uh, it does seem like security is what everybody's worried about. But I just wanted to hear the panel's opinion that there's like uh, that if there's like a plethora of sectors of IT we can go kill after. Man, I'm just looking for a job, man. <laughs> I don't care what. As long as it has a keyboard and a mouse, I'm good. I can jump in real quick while y'all are thinking. Um, are you local in the area, Atlanta area? Where are you? Florida. All right. User groups, quiet user groups. Get on Meetup, um, Linux user groups. There's an info set user group. If there are different application user groups in your area, start going to the user groups. Um, if you can't make the meetings in person, get on the mailing list and just start asking questions and start doing networking using person-to-person networking. I've gotten a lot of jobs that way, and I've learned a lot of stuff and found a lot of fun stuff I wouldn't have known existed otherwise. Uh, that's my two cents. Alice? Yeah, if, if um, I, I, I've hired lots of people throughout the year, uh, throughout my career, and, and, and in general, if you're looking for, you know, I'm looking at somebody that's, this is a job change, and, you know, and, 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 you know, look for community, look for companies that are building, like, farming and cyber situations where they've got, you know, entry-level positions that, that allow for growth. Um, what shines between somebody else that just took a class and somebody that really is interested is what are you doing on the side? I always ask questions in my interview, like, what do you do to, you know, what blogs do you read? What, what user groups are you part of? You know, uh, meetups, you know, things like that. If you are part of the community, you know, and you get a, a monocule of skill, you'll find a place that, you know, if you're passionate about it and you're active in your spare time about it, you know, that, that's, that's the differentiator between everyone else that went and paid $20,000 for a one-week class and it says I'm an IT guy now. So. I've got uh, one extra comment here from Dustin Smith, who may be taking over uh, moderating 101 and 201 for me next year. Uh, I think his input is valid because he's got a job right now I would kill for it. Okay. Here's how I started, and I'm going to make this quick. Uh, back when I first started to really get into IT professionally, I, it was a situation to where Everybody who is hiring wants you to have experience, so how are you supposed to get said experience? Well, what did I do? I decided to jump off the deep end and start my own business. And I ran an IT business for 12 years that I have since signed over to somebody else. I got a job with the Navy um, and moved up to Norfolk, Virginia from here. And then two months later, I got a job with NASA that's paying me over double what the Navy was paying me. So, sorry, baby. Good night. You can tell Hunter Higgins to go to hell, right? Yeah, they can go a lot. Yeah, there's still kids in here, so I'm not going to say what I'm You know, I want to congratulate my fellow panelists for these great answers, but I also do want to say that you do not have to do that. Like, not everybody has free time. I know people with small children, they don't have free time. They barely have time to do their own job. There's things you can do within your own organization, uh, taking on more of the work that you're getting paid for, starting to do IT work within your current job. Like, you shouldn't have to do things on the side, and I think we as a community 
should not be requiring that because the people that it leaves behind are the people without the resources, the time, the financial ability to start a risky endeavor like a company in the first place. Um, and I think that it is hard to do that, but if it's something that we who already have these jobs are always looking for, it's not creating the environment. One last very quick comment, you said people who are taking care of kids, um, if you can, bring your kids with you. Start them off, uh, start them young, get them into the wonderful world of hacking at an early age, and their future will be set, and they'll be able to take care of you when you're old. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, question please. I hope that helps, sir. Love your shirt. Thank you. Um, so I, my background is in network security and operational security, so um, like Matt was saying about diversifying and, and making sure that you know all aspects of technology so that you can do security um, as well. My company is starting to uh, develop their own applications. So a lot of Node.js, a lot of like, like different um, scripting things. So I am trying to get into AppSec and a lot of the, uh, <laughs> a lot of the um, security of different applications that are, that, are, that you build yourself. Um, and so I went to a SANS class talking about $20,000 um, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, educational mm -hmm. things. Um, I learned about the importance of <laughs> code repositories and what you should do when you are actually, you know, when you're building things. Um, what are some things that should be in your code repository? Like, what are some of the smoking guns that you found when you're doing different red team things that you're like, oh, this is going to be fun, you know? Um, Hard coded uh, credentials for AWS accounts. That's the longest thing out there. You know, I don't know. There, there's lots of there's lots of things. I mean, static code analysis. You know, that that's where those those guys find all those things. To, you know, and, 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 and trust pull those out. To, you know, I think that you know you're, you're going to you know, teach a team of developers what not to do. You know that's that's what those other tools are for. Right? You know these, these guys that write the, the application security tools. You know we'll let them be you know have all the ideas right and to use those tools accordingly. That's good. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess we can go into further detail at 201. Hi. Right. Um, uh, so yeah, my question is a bit big, so I'm going to make two one, but just to put the, the worm in your brain uh, about this. I've been wondering a lot about, um, like with the recent climate of, uh, of security and, and IS and IT and all this stuff, uh, and, and kind of knowing a little bit about um, security and things like that. With like net neutrality and all this stuff being such on everyone's mind, and net neutrality being, I, I think, important and I, an idea, but the idea of not non net neutrality and, and securing and having everything mapped out and everything understood, basically like a wall, and it, that is more secure. Like you can watch more things, you can understand what's going on. I want. I was just wondering how y'all felt about it because it's, it's strange because while security is good, you know accessibility is another thing. It's it's, it's kind of like a, a tug of war. It seems. To me. And I was just wondering, like, what you your feelings towards that like neutrality. As one of the panels commented, that's deep. Oh, so, um, <laughs> um, just grew. We we may, we may have to think about. Yeah, no, I'm gonna get, get back to one too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have fun talking. Is that right? I think that's gonna be like a beer and pizza question tomorrow. Night. I have feelings on that neutrality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, they do promotions and coupons and all this other stuff. 
and uh, a friend of mine was doing a test, a test run and stuff, and uh, the CPU's going crazy. Okay, and he looked at it, and he dug it a little bit further, dug it a little bit further, and it was mining Bitcoin. <laughs> okay, and you know, this, was, this is a major piece of you know, international software here that a lot of companies would have been accessing. Uh, they dug into it, and it wasn't the code that they written. It wasn't because of the, any code they'd written. It wasn't even because of any code that another company was also working in, in hand with them had done. Those people had, had set up a fourth-party code that had, you know, that they were then using that had been infected with the bitmining stuff. So you have to sort of like you have to think about multiple levels of security in terms of not just you. It's not just the people you're directly working with. It's anybody that they're do, you know, pulling in third-party code for. You know, that, that, that's sort of like, you know, you wouldn't think, oh, 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 oh. Code, yeah. audits, and watching, code yeah. audits and watching what goes in and out of your network. That helps a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, go for it. Go for it. Last question. So, uh, my question would be, as, uh, as an IT guy, uh, I've been, you know, kind of running the game the past couple of years, and uh, I'm not too fond of uh, what I'm doing currently. I'm looking to transition to more security-based work instead of just general IT grunt work, um, would the military or you know, defense contracting be a good transitional platform, or should I just not do that? I have greatly enjoyed my recent federal contracting gigs, and I will look forward to more of them. I think Dustin will agree, since that's what led to his NASA dream job. Yes, I'm jealous. So, yeah, uh, if you can pull that off, uh, a couple of keywords I'm going to give you to research and make sure you won't have problems with this. Public trust, that's kind of like the basic uh, federal level background check they do, and secret clearance, uh, see what the requirements are. The short version is you want to make, be honest in your interviews, admit everything, everyone's got stuff in the background, that's not a problem. The uh, main thing they're looking for is to make sure you're not, uh, you can't be easily black. So, and I'm, I'm a part of an organization that's building out one and like 17 people, so like, you know, about 132 or so. And, um, and, and what's interesting is, is that a lot of people who are hired are first military. Um, you know, and uh, they, they've got lots of great skills. Uh, there's also a transition from going, you know, you do go into the military and getting back out. Uh, in, in, in that. But that, um, you know, that is, you know, I've, I've seen a very successful run. You know, we're, we're lots of folks. I've got my oldest son's in the Navy. He did do cybersecurity. He's you know wanted to play on on aircraft carriers. But but the, you know a lot of people that I'm hiring are post military coming up with board and a lot of you know other places that you know that, that, that have, have lots of pretty good information security skills. So it's it is you know of course on your your personal you know, situation. But for a career path, you know I'm I'm hiring the private sector people that are post military. One last pitch for Hacking 201. This is where a lot of the personal networking goes on. People have gotten jobs through the after hours uh, um, pizza and beer sessions at Hacking 201. So I encourage you to show up, talk to folks, and have fun. Um, if you're interested in 2600 meetings, 2600.com has a list of all the meetings worldwide. If there's not a meeting in your area, they have information and uh, people you can talk to to help set up your own local 2600 meetings. Uh, Linux user groups are also a fantastic source of further information. Um, I think we're out of time. You went to 201? Yeah. Our, okay. So, uh, um, oh, oh uh, yeah. Anybody that never carries cash, you can Venmo me Alright, so Hacking 201, EFF track room tomorrow night at 10 p.m. until whenever. Uh, theoretically, we can go until they throw us out at 10 a.m., I guess, if you want to actually do that. We've done it before. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and anyone who wants to go out and do the money collection honesty check with us. We will be outside this door here, out of the way of the people who are coming in from that panel. Thank you all very much. I know there's a lot of fun stuff to do right now. Thank you for coming. Thank you.